So welcome this afternoon to this uh, webinar on the one-click LCA um, EPD generator tool. Which uh, so we're joined here today by Verity from OneClick. Um, we'll do proper introductions in a minute when everyone's joined. So uh, we'll just uh, hold on, hold fire for a second. But uh, get yourself ready, get yourself a cup of tea, and we'll be joined starting in a minute or so. Do you have any slides to share, Charlie, or should I start sharing mine now, just for the intro? Oh, so yeah, you can start sharing yours, Verity, if you want. Awesome. About 16 people so far, so... Give it another another minute or so. Well, we haven't had any uh, haven't had any new people join in the last minute or so, so I'll I'll start doing a few introductions anyway. So hello again. Um, my name's Charlie Law. Uh, I'm Sustainability Director at Timber Development UK. Uh, welcome to this uh, CPD on uh, or webinar lunchtime webinar on the uh, One Click LCA EPD Dev Generator tool. I'm joined here today by Verity uh, from uh, from One Click. She'll let uh, I'll no doubt introduce herself and uh, give you a bit of background on the tool in a second. Um, but really just wanted to uh, sort of introduce why we're, we're looking at this system. So we are um, uh, in, a, in a situation where uh, climate change is very much the, the big topic at the moment. Um, we've, you may have seen that we launched our net zero roadmap uh, in January. So um, and obviously one of the parts of that is very much around uh, measuring your own carbon emissions and making sure you know what your scope one and two emissions are. But going forward, um, a lot of your customers uh, will be asking for what they call environmental product declaration or EPD data um, for the embodied carbon within your product so that they can work out what the embodied carbon is for their buildings. Um, we are getting a number of requests for this information already um, from some of the big um, uh, the big associations, so people like iStruct-T and IOBA are starting to ask for this sort of information already. Um, so we need to make sure that uh, your, you guys are you know, up to speed on what, that, uh, what the process is and, and how, uh, how to generate a, an EPD. Um, that will then obviously enable you to um, give that information, hand that information on to, to your customers and, and subsequently the, uh, the developers of the buildings. So that's uh, the key reason. Um, Obviously, we, we are looking to reach net zero by 2050 as, a, as an organization. Uh, Timber Development UK is, is obviously pushing its members to, to, to join that, 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 uh, that journey. Um, and, and obviously that includes the, uh, our, um, uh, our specification, uh, our specifier members, so architects and engineers that are obviously looking for this information. So this, this is very much a bridge, uh, this EPD is very much a bridge between uh, supplier members and your uh, specify our customers. So it's really important that you understand what this is all about and uh, and start to put systems in place to, to look at generating these EPDs if, you, if they're not already in place within your organisation. So that's just a, a quick introduction. I think we've got about 20 attendees in now. So um, I think that's near enough everyone that's going to be joining. So um, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to Verity. Thanks, Verity. No problem. Thank you. Cool. Okay, so just um, a little introduction to kind of the agenda for today. So um, firstly, I'll introduce uh, myself and also one LCA, what we do. Some of you may have heard us, some of you may have not. 
Um, then the idea is to go into a little bit of an introduction on the basics of what an EPD is and why they are growing in importance in the construction supply chain. Um, and then I guess the main part of this will be how to create an EPD with one click LCA. So what kind of information do you need to provide? Um, and then also showing you kind of a step-by-step -step tutorial of the software in action and how you put it all together. And then also a little bit about our onboarding process so our training process to get you up and running, creating your EPDs, um, a little bit on um, our EPD Hub, um, who is a third party that we work with for verification and publishing of EPDs. And then we'll have a little bit of a Q&A at the end for any questions. So briefly on myself, so I'm Verity, um, I'm a business developer for OneClick LCA. Um, I've been with the company for about 18 months. Um, I cover our product LCA software, so our See the Footer in Carbon Footprints or EPDs um, for UK and Ireland. Um, before OneClick, I worked um, for an offsite print frame manufacturer um, helping to develop their sustainable construction systems and also look at making their manufacturing process is a little bit more efficient. So I've got a little bit of background in timber. Um, a little bit on one click. Um, so we are a life cycle assessment software provider, basically. Um, we are based in Helsinki in Finland, um, but then we've got staff kind of remote all over the globe. Um, I'm in Swansea in the UK at the minute. Um, we sell it in about 120 different countries worldwide at the moment, and we've got about 130 in-house staff. We've got four main software platforms, which although I'll only show you our manufacturing software, um, it's quite useful to just understand the other platforms because quite often your clients may be using them and that might be why they need your EPDs. So our building software, kind of our original software, that's all about calculating the embodied carbon of a whole building um, or even an, an interior project in some instances. So ideally to do that, you would have an EPD for every single product that goes into that building. Um, so we've, we've, we're the only central database for every single construction EPD in the world. So it acts as quite a nice catalog uh, for developers and architects to be able to find products that have EPDs. Um, obviously, we appreciate that not every product does have an EPD by any means, um, so we've got a very large generic database in there as well. Um, there's about 130,000 different data points overall across all of our software platforms, so a lot of that will be generic data on various construction materials. Um, the infrastructure software is very similar, it's just for infrastructure projects rather than buildings. Um, our, our greenhouse gas reporting software is, is about reporting your scope one, two, three emissions. Um, and then our manufacturing software or our product software is what I'll show you today. So the most basic level of this is just doing the carbon footprint calculation. The slightly higher level then is actually creating an EPD. So you have to report on a lot more than just carbon. Um, you have to follow various standards and regulations as well. So we pretty much work across the whole construction industry with that whether it's engineers, architects, manufacturers, builders, investors, institutions, et cetera. So quite a range um, of end users, depending on what the application is. Um, and then these are just some of the guys that are using our product only software. So pretty much all of these are doing EPDs. Some of them use the tool for R&D activities as well, um, looking at how they might be able to reduce their emissions um, and, and use it as a bit of an eco design tool. So, in terms of EPDs, I don't know how much all of you know. Some of you might be experts, some of you might know nothing. So I'm going to start as if you know not too much. Um, and hopefully I, I won't bore you if you do. Um, but an, an EPD is basically an environmental product declaration. Um, and it's a document which transparently communicates the environmental performance or impact of a product over its lifetime. So they are based on standards and they do have to be third party verified as well. In terms of why they're important, I'm not going to go into too much detail here um, because we're all pretty aware of, of the net zero goals and, and, and what global warming is, but just to give you an understanding of why it is so important in the construction industry. Um, so obviously, um, construction globally is responsible for around uh, 40% of our, our global emissions. 28% of that comes from uh, operational emissions and about 11% comes from materials in construction. It's also uh, responsible for about half of our global resource consumption. So 
pretty significant um, and that's why it's an area that is a heavy focus. I don't know why I've just, uh, my slides have, I think my mouse has died. That's not ideal. No, okay. There we are, it's better. Um, so within the next uh, kind of, well, 20, 30 years, uh, by 2060 is, is expected that our global building stock will double. Um, so cities are gonna grow by about 230 billion meters squared, um, which is gonna result in about 100 to 200 gigatons of embodied carbon. That is the equivalent um, of basically um, building another New York City every 34 days until 2060, um, or it's equal to approximately three years of global energy carbon emissions. It's useful to understand, I guess, how those emissions uh, look in terms of a building. Um, so this diagram here basically shows um, the emissions over the lifetime of a building. So you can see the start here is what we often call uh, the carbon burp. Um, this is all of the upfront emissions that are produced from the, the initial build of that building. So all of the materials that are going to that building, the transportation and also the construction. Then you can see steadily over the lifetime of the building, um, it's releasing carbon in terms of operational energy. And there are various little bits of, of embodied carbon in terms of replacement as well. And then obviously you have your end of life. Oh, there we are. Obviously, the, the last diagram didn't take into account um, operational energy um, and, and grid decarbonisation. So as the grid decarbonises, obviously, operational energy is going to reduce and therefore embodied carbon is going to become a much more significant part of our global emissions. So that's why EPDs are basically so important. They are seen as the way that you can measure those materials, measure those emissions and reduce them as well. So. Um, in terms of policy, regulation, guidance, um, there is already quite a bit out there. Um, the, the World Green Building Council um, released their, their guidance on bringing embodied carbon up front. Um, obviously, it is planned that we will be net zero by 2050 in terms of operational and embodied carbon. Um, by 2030, there should be about 40% less embodied carbon in our buildings. So as Peter Drucker once famously said, you cannot measure, uh, manage what you can't measure. So that's effectively what EPDs are. They are basically reliable carbon building blocks um, in order to help make up a whole building life cycle assessment. Um, life cycle assessments are becoming increasingly important. They're not yet mandated in the UK, apart from with the Greater London Plan. So in London, you do have to do whole life carbon assessments on significant new builds. And there are a lot of other schemes that are now mandating them as well. So to do them, ideally you want to be using an EPD because it's the most accurate way to do it. Otherwise you'll be using some kind of generic data, um, which is generally a little bit overcompensated. They're also um, useful in a number of other ways to clients. Um, so for instance, if they're doing BRIAM or lead assessments um, or other global sustainability compliance assessments, they get credits for using products that have EPDs. So it does help them to achieve those higher standards. Um, and also just to stay, stay relevant um, in the market. So obviously the market is going green. There is a much larger, larger focus on sustainability now. So EPDs allow um, people to be able to compare products um, and choose more sustainably. Why are they reliable? Um, they're reliable generally because they are based on standards. Um, so EPDs follow a number of standards. Um, so they, they're based on life cycle assessment calculation standards. So the ISO 14040 um, and also 14044. And then the main kind of EPD for construction product standards in Europe is the 15804. So all of our software is templated to those standards. Um, the idea is if you fill it all out, it's gonna create a, a compliant report at the end. In terms of creating your EPD, you have to cover a, a, a range of information. Um, an EPD basically looks at the entire life cycle of your product. So the, the mandatory steps you have to cover, you have to cover your A1 to A3 stages. Um, so extraction of your raw materials, transport to your manufacturing site, and also your manufacturing energy. You also have to cover your end of life. 
So this is generally all scenario based. So what is most likely to happen to your product at the end of life? So energy to deconstruct it, transporting it for waste processing, and then how it will be processed. You can also cover your construction and use phases. Um, these are not mandatory as far as EPD standards are concerned, but depending on what your product is, um, they or may or may not be, be applicable. Effectively, the construction phase is transporting to a construction site, so an average distance to do that, and then any energy or materials used to install your product. And then your use stage will be all of the, the emissions that are resulting of uh, the use of your product over its lifetime. So maintenance, replacement parts, if it is an electronic product, then you will need to account for operational energy as well. The idea of the one-click software um, is that we have hopefully automated as much of this process as possible for you. So, so making it a little bit more streamlined and a little bit easier. Um, so we train you up. So you know what you're doing in terms of the software functionality, but also in terms of um, the LCA methodology. Um, you then need to collect your data. So that's data in terms of your manufacturing energy, your materials you're using, the quantity of those materials, uh, the, 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 the transportation emissions and, and distances as well. From that, you effectively put those quantities into our software and pair them with a the data point. And then we automatically create your LCA, your EPD and your report for you. Um, and then we send it off to the third party verifier and publisher. Um, so all EPDs do have to be verified and published. We are not the verifier, um, but we, we, the idea is that we're kind of a one stop shop. So we deal with all the communication for you and everything goes through us um, and we send it off to be verified. The software is all designed to be as easy to use as possible. Um, the idea is that we can teach anyone to be able to do an LCA. You don't necessarily have to be a sustainability expert or anything like that. Um, so it's all quite intuitive. And it's powered by data. So there's about 30,000 different data points in the product software. Um, a lot of that comes from a database called EcoInvent. It's a big global average database for uh, manufacturing emissions, material emissions, things like that. Um, we've also obviously got every single EPD in there and we do have some of our own data points in there as well. Um, we do have various integrations. This little image here for Revit is more for our building tool. So if you are using the building tool, you can import like your whole Revit model and it will do a whole building calculation. Um, for the product side of things, basically, you can either do it manually or if you can export your bin of materials in an Excel format, you can import them into the software and save a little bit of time if you do have a lot of components. We also have templates. Um, so a template in the software is basically a pre-done lifecycle assessment for a similar product to yours. Um, there's some examples of templates that we have available for timber-based products at the moment on the screen. And um, the idea is then you can go in and you can tweak and change the assessment that's pre-done for you. And hopefully it's gonna make life a, a lot easier. Um, if we don't have templates to match, we can create new ones as well. Okay, I'll actually show you the software now. So I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll share a different screen. There we are. I'm assuming everyone can now see the, the software. If you can't, someone someone shout. No, it's all good, Verity, you can see that. Yeah, cool, there we are. So this is the software. Um, within the software, you can have as many projects as you want to. So these are all different projects that I've got here. Um, we're going to do um, an example of wood fiber installation today. Obviously, I appreciate that you all produce very different products, um, but the concept is exactly the same, no matter what your product is. Um, so within a project, you can have as many products or designs as you want to. Um, these designs could represent a range of very similar products that you might have, or they could represent, um, maybe if you're doing an R&D activity and you wanted to compare your product with hypothetical product two, and you're looking at how you could reduce your emissions. So this number here is your CO2 equivalent per your product. As these are timber products, they are very low carbon. So this one's actually got zero kilograms of CO2. Um, and then this one has only got one kilo of CO2. So you can compare the products against each other down here. 
and you can see the different life cycle stages and where each of those emissions are coming from. So although this is very low on carbon, um, you can see that most of the, the emissions are coming from the raw material extraction, um, and then there is a little bit from transport and also manufacturing as well there. To get this number here, you have to either input against these different tabs, or you can copy data from another design if you've already done one that's quite similar, and you just want to copy it and tweak it. Or you can import from Excel as well if you've used our, our data collection form. Um, but for now, I'll just talk you through the, the tabs manually so that you can see basically what goes into it. So the idea is all of the tabs are on the top now. If you fill out all of these tabs, you're going to be compliant with the EPD standards um, and it will, it will generate your report at the end. So the first tab is just a, a bit of a description about what your product is, who you are as a manufacturer. This is for some wood fiber insulation that's made in Finland. And then also um, a really basic raw material composition here. This is just because the EPD standards, you have to, to show some kind of material on the front, but it's done in a lot more detail in your materials tab. Um, but your materials are obviously confidential, so, so they're not shown here. Um, and then also any biogenic carbon. So most of you will have biogenic carbon in your products because you're all using timber. Um, so we've got ways of helping you calculate that, but that's declared here whether that's in your product or whether it's in your packaging as well. I have a drink of water. The next tab then is your declared unit. So this is just the unit your EPD or your assessment is for. So this is for a meter squared of wood fiber insulation of a particular U value. It could be for a meters cubed of timber. It could be for a meter squared of sheet material. Um, it could even be for a litre of paint. It really does depend what the product is and what the most suitable declared unit is for your clients to use. You then also include a mass of that unit and you can include a service life here as well if you have one. Your materials then are um, where you start doing the work. So it's basically a case of finding the data point to represent all of the raw materials that are going into your product. Um, and also any processes um, that happen before they get to your manufacturing site. So either you can use generic industry average data here, or you can use EPD data. So for instance, if you're um, a timber frame wall manufacturer, you might use a lot of components within your wall that already have EPDs. So for instance, um, if you've got some kind of sheathing board, there might be an EPD already out there. So you can actually find that EPD and use it in your assessment. Otherwise, um, if your suppliers don't have EPDs themselves, um, then you would use generic data. So for example, this wood fiber product um, has got a, a construction of, of data points here. So a number of data points making up the wood fiber, but you can see that they've got a data point here to, to represent some wood chips. Um, and then they've got also some recycled wood chips as well, some sawdust, um, and some pulpwood. So all of these are individual data points. If, I, um, if you click on a question mark here, it brings up a data card. So it tells you where this data point comes from. So it's come from the EcoInvent database. Um, it also gives you a description of exactly what this data point includes, just so you can check that it is applicable to, to what you're buying in. And then also it gives an environmental profile as well of that data point. So I'll just show you an example. Like if you search for um, spruce, for example, here, you could search for a manufacturer, you could search for a product, you can search for kind of all kinds of things. Under forestry and logging, for example, there are data points to represent different types of um, kind of forest management or, or forest um, What's it called? Basically logging and, and growing the trees. Um, so again, if you click on those data points, you can have a look at them in a bit more detail, but you can see there's global data points. So they're global averages and there's also country-based data points as well. You can also search for things like I put MDF in here, for example. You can see all the five awards that come up and you can have a little look at those. Um, so a lot of these have got color clouds next to them. Um, these are generally EPDs, 
Um, and we've th there's no current way of ranking an EPD or grading an EPD as such. The only way that you know if an EPD is good or bad um, is by comparing it with a similar product. So that's effectively what we've done here. Um, if you look um, under environmental profile, the C4 ranking here, we have basically taken all the fiber builds or MDFs that have uh, EPDs, um, so there's about 175 of them, and then we've ranked them from one to 175, depending on their environmental impacts. This is useful for yourselves because you can set yourself a benchmark, see maybe where you want to sit in the industry and have a little look at competitors. But this is also really useful for the people who are using the building tool, because this is potentially how they're going to be looking and comparing products. You can also compare products side by side. You can click this add to compare button or you can bring up two data cards next to each other as well. So that's how you search for materials. You can also search for processes um, as well there. You can filter these as well by different countries or types of data point. Manufacturer specific data is just EPDs, for example, whereas generic data will be more industry average data. You'll select your data point that you want to use. Then you'll include the quantity that you're using per your declared unit. So per meter squared of this particular wood fiber, they've got 1.8 kilos of wood fiber. And then they have also included the transport. So this is where you're getting that material from to get it to your manufacturing facility. Um, so this can be in, in kilometers, and then you'll find a data point to represent the type of transport that you're using. And you can include leg one, leg two of the journey here. If there's more than two legs to that journey, you can add it in down the bottom here under additional transport. That's it for the, the, the kind of the, the main materials. You also have to include any ancillary and packaging materials. Um, so that is anything that's used in your manufacturing process that isn't necessarily part of the final product. So it could be water, for example, or it might be oils in your machinery. Um, or it could just be your packaging materials. It's exactly the same concept. So finding a data point, including it, including your quantity and also your transport. Additional transport down here then. So any further legs to the, to the journeys up here, or even if you're just moving maybe from one factory to another, then you can include that here. Your next tab is your manufacturing tab. Hopefully it won't take too long to load. There we are. So this is all of the energy that you're using in your factory in order to produce one of your declared units. So you have to take this as an average of a year's worth of data. Um, so generally you can't produce a full EPD unless you've been producing your product for a year. Um, there are things called design phase EPDs, um, which you can do, but they, they only last for 18 months and then they have to be updated. So you'll look at your energy mix that you're using, uh, whether that's grid-based UK energy or if it's some kind of renewable energy, and you'll include the quantity um, that you're, you're using per your declared unit. So can sometimes take a little bit of creative maths to work this out. Um, and some companies meter their production lines, others don't. So it could be a case of looking at your annual energy bill and dividing it by the, the quantity of products you're producing a year. You'll also include manufacturing waste and wastewater as well, um, and also any process direct emissions. I will briefly go into the construction and use phase as well. Um, they're not mandatory, but a lot of, of companies will want them covered. So construction would be average distance that you might transport to a building site or to an end user. And then installing into the building. So how much of your product might you lose during installation, if any. And then also any energy you might use to install it, whether that's in cranes, machinery, hand tools, um, and also any uh, materials. So they've got uh, diesel here, for example, um, and then they've included 2% waste of, of wood fiber they think they might lose. Um, also, you would include installation waste and wastewater here as well. So there's different types of, of data points to represent different types of waste treatment. And then also any additional transport. Your use stage then 
is effectively um, any maintenance, repair, replacement parts. So if you just install your product and you expect it to stay there for the, the rest of the building's life without touching it, then you will definitely not do this space. Um, but if you do expect, like with windows, for example, you would expect that there would be some maintenance and repair, so you would include those here. End of life then, you do have to do, my team's popping up. Um, this is all scenario based. So what's most likely to happen to your product? So how uh, may, might it be uh, taken apart at the end of its life? How much energy has gone into taking it apart? And then roughly where might it be transported for waste processing? And then how will it be processed? So in this particular example, they've put 100% of the wood fiber insulation is going to be incinerated. Um, but whether it could potentially be biodegraded or, or et cetera is, is up to you and what you think is most likely. Um, they've also got the balancing of the CO2 emissions released at the end of life. So obviously bio-based products do sequester a lot of timber, but that is also then released at the end of life. So that has to be accounted for here. Benefits of loads beyond the system boundary is pretty much the final part. Um, this is things like if, for example, you are burning waste in order to produce energy, you claim the benefits of that energy production, which they've done here with their wood pallet incineration. Um, and also, if you are recycling any materials, then you claim the benefits of those materials not needing to be re-extracted again, basically. This is one of the examples or reasons the templates are really useful because generally a lot of these end of life scenarios will be similar for yourselves and it's just a case of tweaking the, the quantities rather than actually necessarily finding all of the data points. The EPD description then um, is pretty much just giving a little bit of context to whoever is reading your EPD. Um, rather than them just seeing a number. So you can tell them a little bit more about all of your manufacturing processes, um, about where you're getting your, your supplies from, or if you're doing anything particularly sustainable, you can write about that here. Obviously only if you want it to be publicly available. And then the last thing is just pictures, visuals, the standards you've done it to. There's not too much going on in this tab. It feels strange not having people asking me questions. I feel like I'm writing at you, but I'm sure there'll be lots at the end. Um, I'll show you the results. So the results are, are seen here in a few ways. You've got them just in the software. Um, so you've got them in, in a readable format here. You can see all of these are all of the impact categories you have to report on for an EPD. Um, and then you've got all of your life cycle stages down the side here as well. And then a total at the bottom here. You can put this into decimals as well if you prefer. It tends to look a little bit nicer and a bit easier to, to read. Um, most people are interested in your, your global warming potential for your A1 to A3 stages. So that's kind of the most commonly referred to number. We do also include the old standards. So the, the EN1584 plus A2 standard came into play in, I think it was July last year. Um, so this plus A1 standard. EPDs last for five years. So there's a lot of EPDs out there still to the plus A1 standard. So we include these results as well, just so you can compare directly with those. And then depending on which license level um, that is taken, we have various other results. So the American uh, market tends to do things a little bit differently. So they have slightly different results for their Tracy standard. Similarly with the French and the Dutch market, they have slightly different results. So we, we provide those there as well. And you can also think, see things like use of natural resources, end of life waste, um, things like that. And then there's various charts and graphs here at the bottom. Also, if you want to visualize the results or use them for any marketing information as well. Then most people want to see this. Also, you can download it in a few ways. You can download it as a uh, Excel document. Um, most people want to see it as the Word document. It takes about a minute to download, so I pre-downloaded it um, before the meeting so that we don't all have to sit here in silence for a minute. Um, but this is effectively what it will generate. So it will take all of the information you put into the software, pop it into this report. Um, it's got a, a data summary on the front. This is kind of the key information that most people want to see on your EPD, so it saves them trawling through the whole thing. Um, 
you've then got all of the standards that you've covered, your product description, your uh, raw material composition there, um, just basically, and then also the scope you've covered. So whether you've done those use stages or, or end of life stages or not. And then also um, all of that additional information that you've put in. You can also put in your own process flow diagram in if you want to. And then at the bottom here is all of your results. So this is quite a typical EPD results table if you have looked at any EPDs before. This is then, you can obviously tweak and change this in terms of your logos and, and a little bit of kind of how it looks, but you can't change any of the data. This is then sent off to uh, be published. So we work with uh, a couple of publishers, but our, our main one is EPD Hub. So you can actually submit this to EPD Hub straight from the software here. Um, but you would also kind of notify our team that it's being sent off. The last little thing that's quite useful to see in the software is this create PDF button. This just creates a quick one page carbon footprint document. It's completely self-declared, um, but they can be quite useful if um, you do want something that's a little bit easier to read and you just want to look at carbon or maybe your client wants a bespoke calculation um, and it's not worth doing an EPD, you can produce these quite quickly. I think that's pretty much it on the um, software background. If I go into here. Cool. So the next part then is a little bit on our training. Um, so we are a training provider. Um, we provide training with every software license we sell. Um, but the EPD training is pretty in depth. Um, we basically hold your hand throughout your first EPD so that you know what you're doing. And then hopefully you can replicate that process again yourselves in house on further products. Um, so we have an online academy, um, but it's, we also have one to ones with our team. Generally, we tend to say that you can choose to either do your, your training over a 10 or 16 week period. The idea of it being over this length of time is that quite often it takes you that long to go and get your data. Um, so we, we found that if we did it in a shorter period of time, people would all slow down by data collection. So the idea is you can start the training, we can tell you what data you need to get, you can then go and get it, and then you can carry on inputting it into the software. So the 10 week program, we tend to say you need to commit about a day a week to not just doing training, but doing background work, collecting your data, putting all of your numbers together. The actual training is about one to two hours of that week or each week. Um, it's a combination of online one-to-ones with our training team. And then we also have this online academy as well. Um, I can briefly show you what it looks like here. I've got my share bar up top here. Okay, here. So this is the academy. Um, this is the EPD onboarding course. So I show you the overview. Um, you've got your chapter one, for example, what an EPD is, what an LCA is, an introduction, and um, all of the key concepts. Chapter two then goes into a bit more detail on your data collection um, and each life cycle stage and what data needs to be covered. Then you've got obviously software navigation, scenarios, use stage, etc. And I'll just show you briefly what that looks like in course format. This is obviously good for doing your first EPD, but it's also quite good to refer back to as well once you've, you've finished and you might have some questions. So this is kind of what it will look like. So chapter one, lesson one, you've got a look back about what EPDs are. There are a few quizzes in there as well, just to help solidify your learning. And it basically takes you through step by step. Um, the end of each chapter, there are what we call assignments does sound a little bit like school, but it is literally just doing your EPD. That's all those assignments are. Um, and it's just structured so that by the end of the 10 weeks, your first EPD will be done. Get back into here. Cool. Um, so let's go back. So the last or almost last thing is um, just a bit about verification and publishing. Um, so with, uh, with the verification publishing, it has to be verified or published by an approved third party. Um, there are about 50 of them out there, um, but we work primarily with um, EPD Hub and also the international EPD system. Um, EPD Hub are kind of our default just because they are a bit 
quicker, they're a bit cheaper and they're a bit simpler. They've effectively been designed um, in order to speed up the process and make it a bit more efficient. So you're looking at about two to four weeks to get an EPD published with EPD Hub. Um, all of the report that it produces is quite concise, it's nicely laid out, um, and it has your data summary on the front there as well. And that is pretty much it. So I don't know if we have any questions. We've got some questions, Verity. Uh, where are they? I'll just, I'll just, I'll ask them for you. Um, one from Steph Asher. Mm -hmm. um, hello, is there any way architects can use the output of the LCA calculations which manufacturers have done to help with whole building EPD calculations or whole life carbon assessments of a building? I'm assuming that she's asking. So can they access, I think that she's asking, can they access the information? Yes. So obviously if you publish it as an EPD, um, then it's going to appear in our software and then you'll be able to use it um, as part of your calculation. Um, if you, I don't know if that's what you're asking or if you're asking if they don't publish it. So if you don't publish it as an EPD, you can actually send it as a, a private data point to people who are using the building software um, and then they can use that as part of their whole building calculation. Um, so the answer is yes, whichever way you do it. Obviously, if it's not been verified or published, um, it can still be used in a building calculation, but you're not going to kind of be able to use it on Briam or need assessments or things like that. So it's it's not an approved data point. Um, does that answer your question, Steph? I've, I've uh, enabled your mic if you want to talk. Shy. <laughs> Can't hear anyone. Okay, no worries. Yeah, we've got quite a quiet audience. Hello. Hello, oh, Steph. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh right. Cool. Um, yeah, so we are looking at um, uh, embodied, uh, lo looking at how we can calculate like embodied carbon and things in, in our construction process and buildings that we design. So um, we were wondering if this is, if the output from these tools can be then transferred to us and then we can use that or if there are tools that then take this the next step so say you've got like 10 different products which have got have been have used this process and have created um their calculations and you know then you could take all of them and you could start to build a bigger picture of the whole building yeah so yeah. that is our building software effectively i can show you uh, briefly what it looks like okay um, so this is generally used by architects or engineers, uh, or developers, and this is how you compile all of that information into a whole building LCA. I see, so, oh, that's useful. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that, I mean, there's, if I go into here, so if down the left-hand side, it's all laid out very similarly to the EPD tool. So if you right. can use one, generally it should be quite intuitive to use the other. Um, okay. Down the left-hand side, you've got all of your, methodologies basically for doing a whole life carbon assessment so the RICS uh, methodology is generally the most common um, okay. and then have buildings along the top here generally uh, these buildings right. might resemble each life cycle or each each stage of your project so you might do a really early design phase uh, and then as your building progresses and you start to specify products you can do more and more accurate assessments okay but, so those Sorry, yeah. those those buildings are. Sorry, I, I realise this is not about this tool, so I'll keep. No, that's it okay. It's still useful to, to know how um, they use, basically. But that that those buildings one to four, that's the same project, but as you're refining the information, is that what you meant? Sorry, so you change, yeah. you refine the information that you're putting into work at the whole building calculation with each. It's not different projects. It's uh, the same project. And yeah, then, so you can okay. use it in a few ways. You could you could use it as different buildings within a yeah. site if you wanted to, to compare those different buildings or those different houses, whatever they are. Okay. Um, or you could use it, for example, like if you're doing, um, you've got building A and then you've got maybe a retrofit model um, and you're trying to work out whether it's going to be more carbon resourceful to do the retrofit or to knock it down and build a new one. Um, so, or you can use it as each of the stages of the project. Right. So it's okay, quite interesting. Um, I might pop an email to you guys to say, yeah, oh, no, are you going to do a webinar on that one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we've got, okay. um, we have quite a lot of free training in the summer as well, like for, like we have our summer school for EPDs, but also for um, the building software. So, okay, thank so you. We can, but yeah, this so, is just to show you how you search. So the building is broken okay. down into all the parts of the building. 
Yeah. And then you can search for and find those EPDs or use generic data to make up your entire building. Okay, so this this side that the manufacturers do will feed into your your building one then and um yes. It, okay, nice. Basically, yeah. yeah. Okay. Great stuff. Thanks, Steph. Thank you. Um, Mark, if you want to unmute yourself uh, and ask your question, got your hand up there. Mark Murphy. Sorry, it wasn't so much a question, Charlie. I was actually put my hand up when you said, can you see the screen? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. You can see the screen. That's the main thing. Good stuff. <laughs> uh, next on, next question I've got here is then uh, Samuel. You want to... Uh, you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Verity. That was good. Um, I was just wondering on the part about the results, and um, you I don't know whether, so it's kind of a two-part question, is because you had uh, the ones produced for Tra uh, Tracy Innes, um, the Dutch one, and are they actually producing completely different EPDs? Uh, and then my second part of the question is, does it make a difference what input data you use? Because I know with the um, uh, for the building LCA tool, uh, you can't really do a Tracy project with CML data. So if you're doing something in a, in the European um, realm, yeah. Like so that. they're they're all producing EPDs and they're all seen as valid EPDs, but they're just following slightly different standards. So. Unless you're selling to the US, France or Holland, you don't need to worry about those standards, but otherwise the input data is exactly the same. So you do the LCA just like I showed you and it just produces the results for the different standards. So um, it might just have slightly different ways of calculating those results and also slightly different impact categories as well. Um, okay. Yeah. And the, the, they'll all be sort of usable all around the world or? Yes. Or actually, I suppose you can just, um, yeah, you, you're producing multi, like, multiple multinational ones i suppose yeah yeah effectively yeah although i mean if you produce an epd for the to the tracy standard the american market you you can only use that within american standards so you sure. would need if you wanted to produce it for, for the rest of the world you would need to produce it to the end 1584 standard okay cool but that's that in effect that's just an output isn't it very it's a variety it's the, the inputs are, are the, the same it's just how the outputs are are displayed exactly. uh, on the on the epd and you can you know in effect you've got the same product might have three different epds different standards but yeah, it's all exactly. the same information yeah and it's That's worth correct. noting to the other standards we can't do the verification and publishing we produce the report but you then have to send it off to that country specific verifiers is that answer your question samuel yeah yeah that was great cheers great stuff uh Inesh, uh, I've got your name right there. If you want to unmute yourself, you can ask your question. I've got a question, sorry. Hi. Can yeah, you all hear me? Yeah, yeah, can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I know I, I've jumped in on a uh, on a, a timber uh, 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 training on EPDs, but um, I'm actually a PhD student and uh, I've connected with Verity before. And uh, nice to see you, very dear. Good presentation, by the way. Um, I wanted to find out, like, my my interest really is in MEP products and uh, creating these uh, uh, EPDs because I've I've just been finding out that you know uh, with uh, the research that I've been doing that there aren't any EPDs in existence for the products that I want, and uh, I'm very interested in you know working and understanding. Uh, the processes with, with one click. So does this work for uh, MEP products? Is this the same process, like the same way you are uh, describing this uh, uh, for timber products? Yeah, it's literally exactly the same. Um, it's obviously just the data will be slightly different depending on your materials. So yeah, we have a lot of um, companies doing um, products for MEP pro pro products. <laughs> Oh, oh, all right. Okay, great. And uh, yeah. what, what's the uh, issue surrounding licensing? Like, as a student, do I uh, do I? And I've seen that you've got a lot of free uh, free training, but um, accessing the software, uh, do I? Um, uh, what what's the hmm, pricing around that? Yeah. So I I I don't look after educational, but I think we have some free student licenses for sure. So I think the university would have to get in contact. Um, 
if it's going to be used for a commercial project, then it would need to be an eight license. So it depends what the research is. Um, but I can definitely put you in touch with, with our guy who covers all of the educational markets. All but right, generally, okay. it's an annual subscription. Within that subscription, you can do as many LCAs as you want to. Um, but the idea is when you then want to, to verify and publish that into an EPD, you pay a verification and publishing fee. Okay, great, great. And uh, your your commercial licenses, uh, uh, even how, how much are they? How much do they cost? Uh, so like the they, annual license. Yeah, they start at around four thousand pound a year, um, and they go up to about nine thousand five hundred uh, for the year, depending on which level you go for and whether they're a, a named user or a floating license. Um, I guess the one one of the things that. Timber Development UK are looking to do is to create a license pool um, that, that their members can then use in order to lower those costs, um, particularly for companies that only might want to do a couple of EPDs, for example. All right, okay, I'll go, so I'll, I'll go into that uh, in a second. No worries. I'll have to use the education up front because uh, the university, so the university has to get in, uh, in contact with yourselves, yeah? Yes, yeah. Okay, thank you. No problem. Okay, thank you, Tash. Um, the questions from me, Verity, uh, while I was going through that. Um, end of life, the end of life day today, so went over that. Um, obviously, a lot of EPDs we see have a, a number of different end of life scenarios. Uh, we sort of 100% so that then uh, someone who's doing the, the building assessment can pick which end of life scenario they think is most suitable for their particular building. For example, if they're designing it for circularity and reuse, they can pick the reuse element. Is that possible within the one click software to do various scenarios at 100%? Yeah, so in the building side or in the EPD side? An EPD side. So in the EPD side, obviously, your EPD is a published document, so you would need to decide on what your scenario would be for that EPD. You couldn't have different scenarios. Um, I've seen EPDs with different scenarios, with like 100% scenarios. So they'd have one for reuse, one for um, uh, energy recovery, one for recycling, and one for landfill really? generally yeah okay well i wasn't aware of that you'll i can yeah. pass the question on to our epd team um, yeah because if we can do that that then gives the obviously then it's up to the building assessor to decide what happens with their with their product at the end of life if there yeah. was obviously a defined end of life route then for the product exactly. obviously we can include that if it's returned for reuse and that's defined within the the product so we, we can obviously include that as a, as a as an end of life the end of life route but where that's fairly open within a building materials uh, option um one one to look at if you want to have a look at it i can send it over to you is the yeah that would um, be useful obviously in the building uh, it's, it's sawn timber I'll, it's the sawn timber for store ends i'll send that over to you and you see how they've done it it'd be good if we could do that for timber so uh yeah, in, in your tour, if there's different options um uh on the, the only other thing um i i was thinking about because i didn't quite catch it in, in when you're going through the tour and i don't know if it did it um you put the biogenic carbon content in at the front end. Does that automatically then add that in to A1 and remove it at A4, uh, A, uh, sorry, C3 or 4 um, at the end uh, when, you, when you do that, when you put that biogenic carbon in at the beginning? Yeah, so it's not automatic, so it, it does need to be added in manually by yourselves. But yeah, it will then go into the end of life at the end. Okay, so if you add it in at A1, it will come out at, at C. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you... And there is a, a a mass balance um part of the results, so it, it just ensures that everything that's going in is also coming out at the end as well. So you can just check that that it all balances out. Okay, lovely. Um, okay, we we've got uh, five minutes. If there's any other questions from anyone, uh, if not, I'll just do um, just explain what we're looking to do uh, at TDUK. Um, so I haven't seen any more hands go up, so I'll I'll explain that. And if there's any questions on that, obviously put your hand up and we can explain. So um, Verity mentioned there that we're looking to um, uh, have a, um, a buyer license that all of our members can use. Um, it's something we're looking into. Uh, there will be a news item coming out over the next couple of days uh, to explain this. So we thought we'd do this course first and then send out the news items to you. So you had a chance to see the software, see if it's something you'd like to use before we sort of ask you the questions. Um, so you'll see a news item which explains uh, about, obviously a little bit about the software, but also the license that we're looking to, to do. So the idea will be that um, we will issue uh, or allow you to use a license for um, probably a four month period is what we're looking at at the moment. 
Um, so it'd be a four month period and you'd be charged a certain amount uh, per month um, for, for using that software. We haven't decided what that figure is yet because that will depend on uh, obviously take up and demand um, from you from you guys because uh, obviously we're we're, we're going to be paying for the software and we we want to try and make sure we get uh, most of that back. Obviously we're, try, we're, we're, we're trying to make sure that you guys get a good deal because as very was saying, if you buy the license yourself, an annual license, that's going to be around four thousand four hundred pounds. I think was the quote you gave us, Verity, for for an individual license. Um, although you will get a ten percent discount off of that for the first year, I think, unless they sign up for a longer period, wasn't it? If if I remember rightly. Yeah. Um, so, so you do get a small discount off of that, so it brings it down to around four thousand pounds. But uh, for the first year, but what we'll be able to do is probably do it a lot cheaper than that. We're looking for the four month period, probably charging you maybe around a thousand pounds, maybe a little bit more. Uh, depends on the demand, obviously. So that's that's what we're looking to do. So you'll see a, a, an email come out um, over the next couple of days. So if you see that, and and what it, there is, there will be a link to a, a, a form there, uh, basically excuse me, an expression of interest form. Um, and it's basically saying that, yes, you're interested in using this software and that will then come back to us and we can then see how many of you are interested in that. And if we get enough demand for this tool, then we will buy that, uh, we will buy that license um, and, and go forward with that, that option. So just, it's just to give you an idea of what happened. Obviously the verification costs will be separate. That That's a cost that you will have to bear. Um, and that, for simple timber products, when I was looking through the, the cost, it was around two thousand pounds, I think, for the verification cost, if I remember rightly. So, so basically under this tool, and then obviously there's then training costs on, on top. Um, we will be getting a. We, we also give you a fifty percent discount on the training. So Verity is allowed giving us a fifty percent discount on any training that's required. So where that would usually cost sixteen hundred pounds for that ten week or sixteen week course, depending on how you want to do it. That will that will only cost you eight hundred pounds, and that's per organisation, isn't it, Verity? If I remember rightly, rather than an individual, exactly, so you can yeah. have as many people on that course as you want. Yeah. Um, but that's bespoke for your organisation, um, and it's a one-off fee of eight hundred pounds. So a very a very reasonable if you want to, you know, two or three people to go on that course to learn how to do the EPDs. Um, it's a very uh, very reasonable cost there, I think, especially for a ten week course. I think that's that's really good. So that's that's what we're looking to do. If anyone's got any questions on that. Um, uh, we've got a couple of minutes. Um, if uh, anyone's got any questions on that, if not, keep an eye out for that email. And uh, and yes, please come back to us if you if you're interested. It's not we're not asking you to sign up at that point, but we just really want to know how many people are interested so we can gauge uh, gauge where we are. Hey. Uh, so any questions? Any last minute questions for myself or Verity before we before we sign off? We're nearly at two o'clock. We've just got one that's just come in um, from John. John Smith, uh, if you want to unmute yourself. Hello. Hello, John. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Uh, and uh, hi, Verity. Thanks for that. Very informative. Um, one, uh, one quick question. In terms of uh, completed EPDs, um, <clears throat> you'll move we as, as terms of a, a build system. If we then make a change to a, a product or change an energy source from to, to a more green energy, for example. How easy is it to then make a change to a, a completed verified EPD to make those sort of tweaks and changes as we go through the life of the product? Yeah, it's pretty easy to do. Um, you basically just pay a re-verification fee, which is a fraction of the price of the actual publication fee. Um, right. You then tweak it in the software um, and send it again for re-verification. Obviously, if it's a significant change, like it is a whole energy mix that changed, or it's a whole component, Definitely, it is considered that kind of reasonable to do that. If it's yeah. something very small, it's not considered, you know, compulsory to have to go and redo your EPD every time you might change a supplier or, or a small tiny component. Yeah, as so well as so just more questions of, oh, can can we use the software to see what what impact that has on the overall build system EPD mm -hmm. by, you by cut changing out the energy? Or, you can do that. Perfect. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, you Thank can you. use it to do a bit of R and D as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's a good question, John. Yeah, it's a good point. So yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting. So you can, yeah, thanks for that, John. Good question. Any any other last minute questions? I can't see any more hands up. Um, we're now at two o'clock. So if there aren't any more questions, I don't know if it's worth um just mentioning about different types of EPDs. Um, just because there will be a lot of companies that it will apply to. So, um, just briefly, if I go uh, through here. 
there's obviously if you've got a range of products um, then quite often you won't want to do a separate EPD for every single variation. My screen has gone absolutely mad. I don't know what's going on here. We can see that. We can see that. Yeah, you can still see it. That's fine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you can have a single product EPD. This just covers one product. Um, you can have a sister EPD, which is like a variation of an already published parent. So perhaps you published one last year and now you want to publish another one that's quite similar. And they're kind of half the price to publish. There are a few rules in terms of what can and can't be a sister EPD. Um, and then two quite common ones are averaging and scaling. So an average DPD might be if you've got, for instance, five products that are very, very similar. Um, they have the same manufacturing processes. They've got the same end use. Um, but maybe they vary very slightly in terms of material quantities. Um, you can average them together um, to, to create an average DPD. Um, obviously, if you've got one product that's, that looks really good and one product that looks really bad, you might not want to average them. Um, it's just whether if they're they're only changing slightly, it can be a lot more cost effective. Um, so they can't vary more than plus or minus 50% in the global warming potential um, to do this. Similarly, scaling, say you've got one product in, in one size and then you've got it in 10 different sizes, you might just have a scaling table in the back of your EPD to represent those different sizes in terms of their impacts as well. Um, and you can have non-linear scaling as well. So if you've got five components and only one of those components is changing in size, then you can have a non-linear non, non scaled. Hope that's useful. Yeah, very useful. That's okay. great. Thanks, Verdi. Really good. Okay, then. Well, I think we'll bring that to an end. We're just over two o'clock. So um, thank you very much for everyone for attending. Hopefully you found that uh, that interesting. Um, thanks again, Verity, for uh, the presentation. Really, uh, really useful. Uh, I think I say EPDs are, are new to, I think, a lot of our members maybe, and they've heard about them, but it's good to see how they actually go together um, in in detail which is really good um so i think the, the only thing to do is say keep an eye out for that email uh, that news item and if you are interested in it please make sure you let us know because we won't be going ahead with this if, if we don't get enough interest so if it is something you want to do um make sure you come back to us and let us know you are through the form or drop me an email um or send an email into the uh to td uk um thanks very much for your time and uh we'll let you all go and we'll thank see you, you again soon thank you, you bye bye